So you were 38 when you became president. And looking back now, do you think you were ready? Well, as ready as anyone uh, <laughs> really can be. I had, of course, two advantages, two huge advantages. One was the fact that I was young and therefore had energy and stamina and could work extraordinary hours, as I did. The second advantage is that, of course, having been in the provost's office for five tumultuous years, I really understood very well what the presidency was all about. Mm. And now that I think about it, I had a third advantage, which many other people don't have, which is that I knew so many people at Princeton. Mm. Mm. I always felt, we're all in this together. Let's figure out how we can help each other right. and get the job done. As provost, um, the CPUC right. and the provost worked very closely together. Absolutely. So. Tell me about your involvement well, with that process. Uh, I had a lot to do with the uh, construction of the CPUC, and it was one of the more useful things I did for Princeton because what it did was impose a structure, an order, on a process that was otherwise all over the place. It was a, a strongly positive thing, at least in my view. So did you assume coeducation was an eventuality before the Patterson Committee? Oh, yes. I had thought for a long time that Princeton simply had to become coeducational. There wasn't a real choice at the end of the day. There would be costs that would cut across the institution in every way. Uh, faculty, the best faculty, many of them would not have stayed. We wouldn't have been able to recruit the students, male as well as female, that we needed. The university would have become uh, anachronistic. And so for me, it was... Um, it was the issue because it did affect um, everything else. What it came to do was to signify the capacity of a great university, which Princeton certainly was pre-coeducation, uh, to change and to become better uh, than it was then. The challenge is really to achieving the greater diversity that, that we all wanted, I think that almost everyone wanted. We're just finding very good candidates in a society that was still quite segregated and where educational opportunity pre-college was by no means equally distributed and so we had to find ways as we did with the help of uh, minority students themselves and other people uh, to reach out to be more effective in persuading people of all races and colors and attitudes uh, to come to Princeton. So, one of my goals was to help not only minority students and women, but also Jewish students feel more uh, included. Probably the most important thing that I did in the last half anyway, uh, it gets ahead of the timeline a bit, the last half of my time in Nassau Hall, was to build the life sciences. I remember very well uh, losing some top young faculty in the life sciences because there weren't the facilities and there weren't the colleagues. So finally, um, we did enough of this. And uh, we decided, the group of us that were leading the university at that time, that we were going to do whatever it took. We were going to spend the money. And, uh, and we did. And that's when we attracted uh, Arnie Levine and Tom Schenck Shirley Tillman then, and just a host of, of outstanding people. I remember very well walking across the campus with Schenck shortly after he had come to Princeton. And uh, he said he just wanted to thank me for all the support I'd provided for molecular biology and the life sciences. And I said, uh, thank you, but all uh, I want is uh, success. And he said, well, he said, we will build here the best molecular biology department in the country.